Die meisten von euch ähm, kennen natürlich Paul Mason ohnehin als einen der ähm, produktivsten linken äh, Journalisten, Publizisten und Public Intellectuals. Er ist Ökonom und was vielleicht nicht alle wissen, er ist außerdem Musiker. Ähm, aufgewachsen ist er in den 16 Jahren in einer traditionellen kleinen britischen Arbeiterstadt ähm, nördlich von Manchester. Und ähm, das damals dort noch ähm, existierende proletarische Milieu und die Arbeiterkultur ähm, prägen seine Texte in gewisser Weise auch heute noch. Ist mein Eindruck, ähm, trotz aller Sympathien für eine postoperaistische Theorietradition. Ähm, es war der Bergarbeiterstreik von 1984, der ihn nach eigener Aussage ähm, zu einem linken Aktivisten gemacht hat und ähm, die dann folgenden leidvollen Jahrzehnte von Thatcherismus und ähm, Neoliberalismus bilden ähm, den Hintergrund auch ähm, dieses tollen Buchs, das natürlich ähm, im Foyer auch zu erwerben ist. Now you can have it as a... Oh no, no, you're speaking now. Ähm, genau, und dann sein Buch, ähm, mit seinem Buch 2012, ähm, Why it's kicking off everywhere, ähm, the, global, the New Global Revolutions, war einer der ersten, ähm, der diesen neuen Bewegungszyklus der Postkrisenrebellionen und neuen Demokratiebewegungen ähm, sozusagen da eine umfassende Einschätzung geschrieben hat. Und in den letzten Jahren hat er, ähm, wie sicherlich alle wissen, sehr, sehr intensiv aus Griechenland berichtet und ähm, jetzt zuletzt auch über die Situation der Geflüchteten in Europa. Paul Mason ist Kolumnist für den Guardian. Er lehrt als Gastprofessor an der Uni von Wolverhampton. Er hat lange für die BBC gearbeitet und war bis Anfang dieses Jahres Leiter der Wirtschaftsredaktion von Channel 4. Dort hat er nun aufgehört um ähm, über die bitter nötige ähm, Alternative zum finanzialisierten Kapitalismus nicht nur zu schreiben, ohne das jetzt gering schätzen zu wollen, sondern sich auch an der Formierung ähm, eines solchen Projekts ähm, aktiv und politisch beteiligen zu können. In unserer Einladung ähm, für heute hatten wir geschrieben, Paul Mason gehört zu den wenigen Menschen, die es schaffen, in der gegenwärtigen Situation den notwendigen Optimismus des Willens aufrechtzuerhalten. Es gelingt ihm, in den Bewegungen der Zustände die wirkliche Bewegung zu entdecken, die es vermag, die Zustände aufzuheben. In dieser Mission ist er heute hier und ich freue mich sehr auf seinen Vortrag. Thank you to the translators. I hope you can keep up with my northern English. I'll stand back a bit. There's a bit of um, feedback on this. Okay. And I also want to start by paying tribute to Rosa Luxemburg, teacher, organizer, fighter for social justice, enemy of everybody who calls themselves socialist but acts in the interest of capital, prisoner, hunger striker, revolutionary and inspirational human being. If Luxemburg and Liebknecht had not been murdered in January 1919, I think her voice would have enriched the Marxism of the 1920s and added power to the other minds who understood the complexity of the task facing the working class, from Gramsci to Kolontai and beyond. Whenever I read the minutes of the early Comintern in the 1920s or survey the events that led to the suppression of the working class and of free thought inside the Soviet Union, I am always haunted by Rosa Luxemburg's missing voice. As an economist, Luxemburg, I argue, was flawed. Her claim that capitalism had run out of new markets and therefore faced a final crisis did not take into account capitalism's unique ability to adapt. While she was writing The Accumulation of Capital, The number of movie theaters in this city grew from one to 168. A new market opened up, not in the colonies, but inside the heads of the Berlin working class. But Luxembourg was right on something very important to our debates today about the new route beyond capitalism. If we ignore the question of colonies and state simply as Luxembourg did, that capitalism is a system that thrives only if it can interact with a world that is not capitalist, then that is a crucial and profound insight. Because today, the world beyond 
the market, which is vital for capitalism's survival, is not only the virgin forest of the Amazon, or as we find out today, the virgin forest of Poland, or even the moon, it is the unconquered territory of everyday life. The smile passed between two people in the queue for Starbucks. The informal child mining network, the car sharing scheme, the family meal. For a stagnant capitalism to survive, all these things must be commercialized. They must be subjected to the dictates of economic reason. This is the new world beyond which capitalism must conquer in order to survive. Capitalism surprised the Marxists of German social democracy in the early part of the 20th century in its, in its capacity to adapt and mutate, especially after the late 1990s, 1890s. The essence of my argument is that information technology has now robbed capitalism of its capacity to adapt, and that this lies behind the stagnation and geopolitical turmoil we're living through. The key fact is, neoliberalism is broken. To understand how and why is the easy part. By neoliberalism, I mean the whole world system, not the ideology. The ideology can change and mutate. But the whole world system that relies on globalization, financial market dominance, wage stagnation, consumption based on high borrowing, imbalanced growth, and imbalanced global trade, and low, historically low, productivity. That is the system that broke in 2008 and has not been mended, and I argue cannot be mended. Neoliberalism was an attempt to solve the problems of the previous model, the Keynesian economic model, by destroying the social power of the working class. In a way, the elite of neoliberalism is the first elite in the 250-year history of capitalist elites, which really meant it when they fought the workers. Even Andrew Carnegie, who once turned machine guns against steel strikers, eventually worked out that libraries are better than machine guns for preventing revolution. But this period has seen a determined and unfortunately successful attempt to suppress the bargaining power of organized labor. It succeeded for a dec decade or so, and then it triggered three boom and bust cycles which have left the world facing stagnation. A low growth, low interest rate, low inflation equilibrium is what the Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, now predicts as the future of capitalism. And I agree, except for the word equilibrium. Because with two and a half billion new people coming onto this planet in the next 30 years, you can't have a low growth equilibrium. Even, if you, even before you factor in the effects of demographic aging and climate, there is a problem. But if we do not create a dynamic economy, a stable economy, an economy in the service of human beings, not finance capital, by the time the effects of climate change kick in, after, 80, after 2050, we are in serious trouble. So the financial crisis that began in 2008 has become a social crisis and has now spilled over into geopolitical fragmentation. And with that, we now have the rise of the anti-rationalist, anti-humanist, ultra-right in the US Republican Party, in the Austrian presidential election, here in Germany, and in the British debate on Euro exit, Brexit. So the hard question is, what replaces neoliberalism? Clearly, for the 1%, it's become an impossible question. You know, they convinced themselves that the neoliberal model's attributes, friction-free markets, global trade, zero pressure from the working class, rapid technological innovation, all these were the perfect form of capitalism. 
They can't imagine anything better. I argue what we're going through then is both a crisis of this economic paradigm, the 25-year-old model that began in 1989, the end of a 50-year or 60-year long wave that began after World War II, and many economists of the mainstream will agree with both of these things. But I also argue that we are seeing the beginning of an epochal change, a change on a scale similar to the rise of capitalism in the 16th and the 17th century. At that time, the English philosopher Francis Bacon wrote, gunpowder, the compass, and the printed word have changed the face of all the world. He didn't have the vocabulary to describe it, but these technologies, together with the external shocks that had destroyed feudalism, enabled Western Europe to recover from the long crisis and stagnation of the end of feudalism and to take off. I think we are going through a change just as big, and it might take a century or more than a century. But at its heart, here's the, here's the thing. Information technology robs capitalism of its ability to adapt in the normal way and simultaneously opens a route beyond the market system, a different route than the one imagined by the people who built this building, but nevertheless a route which I think has a chance of succeeding, ushering in a long period of transition to a position where we have a state, a market economy, and a non-market collaborative economy. I argue information technology has four specific impacts. First, it dissolves the price mechanism, putting, cutting the reproduction cost of many products to zero or close to zero. Second, it blurs the edges between work and leisure and erodes the link between work and wages. Third, it creates, for the first time in 250 years, an innovation cycle where machines destroy jobs, but new, higher paid jobs are not created by the new technologies. Fourth, it enables the spontaneous rise of a non-market sector of the economy where collaboration, non-ownership, and non-managed business models are rising. It was Paul Romer, the mainstream economist, who in 1990 spelled out the implications of doing this gesture. Command C, Command V. Copy, paste. Information goods created by copying are endlessly reproducible. They take up very little space in reality, either as mass or energy. And, said Roma, they are non-rival. So we cannot all smoke the same inch of the same cigarette, even if it's one of those cigarettes which you share among friends. We cannot smoke the same inch. We cannot park our car in the same parking space. But, but we can use the same sound file together, every one of us, at the same time, and without degrading it. After it's been used, it's just as good. Roma pointed out that under conventional economic theory, Provided you have free competition, if something costs nothing to reproduce, then its price is going to fall close to nothing. Incidentally, since we are in this uh, historic place, city, and venue, I will say the same applies if you simply do the calculation under the Marxist theory, the labor theory of value. If zero labor goes in, living labor, and if very small amounts of dead labor are embodied via the energy and the mass of the product, then under the labor theory of value, it does not itself contain much value. And its price, according to the transformation theory, will soon similarly fall close to zero. So one of the few things on which Marxist and neoliberal economics are agreed is that information costs, information under free competition should be quite cheap. Or, as Stuart Brand, the, uh, the, the information theorist of the 1970s put it, information wants to be free. But let's remember 
Information is physical. It requires mass and energy for representation. So, so if this zero price dynamic exists, it exists not just for an MP3 file or a PDF. It, it makes the price of, first of all, computer storage, bandwidth and processing power, and, for example, DNA sequencing fall exponentially. I have brought along one of the few analog tools we still have, which is the analog PowerPoint. Simply, this is it. This is, what the this is what the curve of the price looks like, as if I had a PowerPoint, um, on, of all these things, bandwidth, storage, DNA, processing power. It just looks like that. That's what the price looks like. So much so that the consultancy Deloitte, which is only a capitalist consultancy, has predicted that these technologies will go on developing exponentially that they will not stabilize like electricity or indeed the movies. I don't know whether I agree with that, but if it's so impressive for Deloitte, it's pretty impressive for those of us who want to change the world. The price of a million transistors printed on to silicon was $220 30 years ago. It is now six cents and falling. That one million transistors, of course, is nothing compared to the one billion transistors on your silicon chip in your iPhone, or three billion if you have, a, have an, uh, a, a brand new iPad Air. But that one million transistors that now only cost six cents to print is the same as a Pentium 4 computer. That's what Pentium 4 was. Those of you old enough to remember Pentium 4, it was the first time you could do two things at once on a computer. <laughs> the cost of it is negligible today. Okay, so the price, the zero price thing is not a unique idea to me. It's something that's become embedded in mainstream, mainstream economics. So why don't we have low prices? Because capitalism has developed spontaneous defense mechanisms. First, the suppression of competition through the building of vast monopolies whose only purpose is to prevent competition eroding the price of information goods. You will know if you are an economic historian, for example, that I think something like 90 companies were put together to make Standard Oil. Or tens of companies were put together to build the, the railway monopolies more than 100 tele telephone companies in America were put together to make Bell, Bell Telephone in the 1880s and 90s. In other words, the monopolization process that led to the monopolies of 100 years ago was competition. It's Marxist theory 101. Competition leads to concentration. You get big companies. These big companies were designed from scratch as a single monopoly. Not two, not three, not four, like you get in the supermarket sector or the banking sector. There can only always be one because its purpose, above all, is to suppress the price mechanism. So that, for example, every piece of music that you consume via Apple iTunes has to be 99 cents per track. No matter what the quality is, no matter what the demand is, the supply is always infinite, so supply doesn't come into it. It's 99 cents a track until, of course, Spotify comes along. Then it's $9.99 a month. Somebody calculated that to earn the minimum wage in the USA, if you're a solo artist, you have to have 1,500 plays on iTunes, uh, sales of your track on iTunes. 1,500 sales of a single track on iTunes earns you the minimum wage. On Spotify, unfortunately, it's 1.2 million. So you remember my PowerPoint? That, that curve is the curve that, that happens whenever competition is introduced into information businesses. But there's a big problem with this monopoly defense mechanism. First of all, monopolies erode. Think of Blackberry. Where is it? I if anybody in this room has got a Blackberry, I'd be very surprised. 
Maybe there's some retro, you know, hipsters who like retro things, like big, big cans on your ear and a beard and Blackberry. Good. It'll come. It will come. Yeah? No. Nobody's got one. Think about what happened to Microsoft Windows. Sure, new monopolies arise. We'll go through what they are. But in each phase, they, in each phase, they have to monopolize more than they did before. So that Facebook and Google are not really technology companies. They are technology companies with very clever technology that have become advertising and marketing monopolies. Apple is a hardware monopoly with a music business attached. So if we imagine what happens when Apple, Facebook, Google, eBay, and Amazon all go the same way as BlackBerry, there are two options. We may get an ultra-monopoly. And we, it's very clear now what that ultra-monopoly would be based on. It would be artificial intelligence. Because why do you need two artificial intelligence companies that, to play chess with each other? Um, I think it is, it is, is more likely that if we ever get there, we will get a single monopoly of the artificial intelligence sector. Or competition kicks in, which is, more, which is under normal capitalist conditions what would happen. And then the prices, as with Spotify, will have to fall. And look at the way it's going. Think about Uber. Everybody's fascinated with Uber. And because my thesis, which we'll come to, deals in depth with what you can do with networks and distributed management and um, horizontal structures. People have mistaken things like Uber for the future. Uber is the Alta Vista of the sharing economy. Remember, anybody remember Alta Vista? Some young people go, what is Alta Vista? What is a Blackberry? Um, <laughs> what did they do? They imagined what a market monopoly in the minicab business would look like, imagined the outcome, a race to the bottom, the creation of friction-free, regulation-free uh, markets in um, minicab driving all over the world, and then they created the technology to do it. The, the technology inside Uber could be written in this building by you, to be honest. It could certainly be, be uh, provided by the City Council of Berlin. All that stands in the way is the smash and grab tactics of these so-called platform monopolies, which are to go into a space where there are rules, float the rules, dare the authorities to enforce the rules, and then take them to the European court. That is the strategy. So Uber 2 could easily be replaced, above all by the growing number of so-called platform cooperatives that are being designed. So people are not stupid. Young entrepreneurs have understood that if they sit in a room for five minutes and do the same thought process, whereby the outcome is many competing and collaborating small platforms which do not extract rent from the user, then they could be from, go from the design stage to the implementation stage very quickly. So what I'm saying is, do not be lulled into thinking that any of these market-killing monopolies is permanent or invulnerable. The only people stupid enough to think that are the th people who have put billion dollar price tags on the shares of these companies. This, and Twitter, for example, is going through the, a, a, a sort of wake-up call process as we speak. The second problem for the information monopolies is conceptual. Once capitalism relies on a set of artificial legal protections, copyright, you know, copyright and patent, rig rigidly enforced. Once it, once it relies on that to survive, it's no longer really capitalism. You know, what these copyright and patent lawyers want is that even after the world has exploded, atomized, and drifts as a dust cloud throughout what is left of the universe, Universal Pictures will still own the copyright on the James Bond franchise. Because <laughs> that's what it says in the contract. All time and, and forever throughout the universe. We know what happens to systems that have to be enforced from the computer screen of a bureaucrat every morning and that are non-spontaneous. Because we saw what happened to the Soviet Union. 
Capitalism's beauty was in the granular and small-scale nature of, it, of price formation. If you read Das Kapital, if you read Marx, it is, he is fascinated almost by the beauty of the fact that the system is spontaneous. Once it has to be imposed by lawyers every morning, then it's like a command economy. So now, let's just move to the issues of what information technology is doing to work. It reduces the value of inputs to labor. Basic electronic goods collapse in price. The, at the low end of the workforce, large numbers of people receive wages not determined by the market price, but because they've hit the limits of subsistence and simply earn the minimum wage. Everybody recognizes this problem of, of pooling of, 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 of wage levels around the minimum, but, but nobody thinks about what it, what it means. It means that the market is being abolished everywhere below that. And that if there were no minimum wages, I think we would see wages in the West fall very low very quickly. Next, information blurs the edges between work and leisure. So we sit in a plane doing work with our arms like this. So close that if it were a factory, it would be closed down on health and safety grounds. In fact, it is a factory. It's an information factory. Everybody is working. But there is no boss asking us, are you working or is that um, an episode of Game of Thrones you are watching? because they don't need to. We work to targets at the high level of the workforce. We work to targets, no longer to time. And that's because information allows modularity. My dad's generation had to turn up on time, put a card into a machine, and it went clunk, because if you weren't standing there on the production line, your friend here could not do his work. No, that's no longer the case. The next thing information does Above all, at the low end of skill and wages it is this. It creates the possibility of rapid automation, but not the actuality. We've all heard the prediction from the Oxford University study that 47% of all jobs in the USA could be automated within 30 years. Instead, the USA goes on ma making and creating low-paid jobs. I think this is to do with the need to maintain people inside the finance system and to allow them to consume basic things like mobile telephony, um, internet access, banking. You have to have some form of job, some form of relation to capital, and therefore neoliberalism creates what the uh, British anthropologist David Graeber has termed bullshit jobs. <laughs> jobs that don't need to exist, that pay very little, where, you, as in the old Soviet Union, you pretend to work, they pretend to pay you. <laughs> so we're even using machines now to make basic manual work more coercive. You put a GoPro in the cab of the truck driver to see if he is driving okay or she. And on the arm of the worker in the fulfillment center, you put a GPS so you can track their movements. This heroic generation of info capitalists never thinks, why not replace that low-paid worker by a machine? Because it is cheaper to have the low-paid worker. I don't know about the situation in Berlin, but in the, in, in the UK, the whole notion of car wash has become very different. 20 years ago, a car wash was a machine. Today, in Britain, it's five guys with rags. And the police turn up, they run away because often they have dubious migration status. They are being super exploited, and that's how five men can undercut one machine. This is the capitalism you live in. If we imagine this con continuing, and asset wealth increases, as Thomas Piketty uh, predicts, because it's being fed by the finance system, even though wages are stagnating and falling, then the result is going to look a lot like neo-feudalism, not capitalism. But I argue there is a different route out, and it's the one we can see emerging out of the collaborative networked organizations that have grown up spontaneously in the last 15 years. The examples are few but important. Wikipedia, open source software like Linux, Creative Commons licenses for intellectual property, peer-to-peer -peer finance, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, if you map this new collaborative economy in, digital, in the digital sphere 
onto the old solidarity economy and the social economy, which is well developed in this country. And then on top of that, you map the, the survival mechanisms many working class people have adopted during the crisis. Manuel Castells, the Catalan sociologist, maps these very well in a book called Aftermath. Squats, collaborative free creches, time banks, informal lending networks, hippie stuff done by working class people because there is no other way of surviving. You add these things up, I argue that you get already quite an important collaborative sector. It's a non-market sector. If you then add the fact that the state sector in an advanced economy accounts for about 40% of, of, of the economy, this too can be a powerful lever. Though I argue it need not be used in the way Hilferding and Luxembourg's generation understood it. Modularity, the cheapness of information machines, and the rising access to free knowledge means it is possible to imagine the collaborative models described by the author Clay Shirky in a book called Here Comes Everybody, and by the lawyer Jochai Benkler in a book called The Wealth of Networks. It's, impos it's possible to imagine these becoming a new mode of production. I call this new mode of production post-capitalism. It's based on something mainstream economics and accountancy cannot value, free labor, free time, machines that cost nothing, for software is a machine, machines that cost nothing and that co can last forever. It is the escape of information from the sphere of ownership into the sphere of social and general intelligence. When the OECD in 2013 tried to measure the impact of the internet on the world economy, they concluded, quotes, while the internet's impact on market transactions and value added has been undoubtedly far reaching, its effect on non-market interactions is even more profound. Non-market interactions on the internet are broadly characterized by the absence of a price and a market clearing mechanism. The OECD, in other words, thinks what I think, that this third collaborative sector is effectively non-market. Non What's the problem? Economists can't measure it. There's a do doomed attempt going on in Silicon Valley where they're trying to give everything a micro value to work out if I write a Wikipedia page for one hour and you're a brain surgeon and you contribute um, to your Wikipedia page, how do we measure the value in that? Well, it's not necessary because in an abundance situation, in the situation of abundance, micro measurements like that are not necessary. Information technology, in short, is creating the beginnings of abundance, not in every sector, but like this. Information itself can be abundant. Goods with a high information content are in this vortex downwards, like DNA sequencing, costing a fraction of what they did 10 years ago. Then, the socialization of knowledge alters the relationship between physical things, services, and information, so that our consumption moves away from buying things to buying experiences and buying new knowledge. This is already happening. It's, if, you, if you think, okay, but what about energy and what about raw materials? Yes, those are good questions. But recycling and design improvements like cradle to cradle design, where you design in the recyclability and the aim is for 100% recyclability over the lifetime of a product, which is already happening, if you do that, you can reduce the number of raw materials entering the production process as well. And of course, energy can be renewable so that the only cost is the equipment needed to harvest it from nature. On top of this, as the uh, American business uh, consultant uh, Jeremy Rifkin has pointed out, the Internet of Things, which is machine-to-machine -machine connections, could massively reduce costs as well by building in capacity utilization and prediction into m most parts of, of, of human life. So if you want to be... If you want to be shocking, you could say this. Information makes utopian socialism possible. If you want to be just not so shocking, you can say it like this, in a capitalist way. John Maynard Keynes predicted by 2030 
there would be abundance, that, quote, unquote, the economic problem of humanity would be solved. He predicted it simply on the basis of technological progress plus compound interest. He couldn't imagine the internet. We could imagine, interestingly enough, what, human, what humanity's problem would be if economics ceased to be a problem. That's why he spent the last part of his life creating a state-funded arts sector in the United Kingdom, because he understood that what we would be concerned with then, when we weren't concerned with bread and butter, was beauty and creativity. So most of my, the ideas in my book are not new. What is new is the synthesis of these two debates, Neoliberalism's problem and the stagnation it is causing and the, and the lack of capitalism's ability to adapt beyond where it has already reached. The other thing I am contributing to this debate is the insistence that those, this world of peer-to-peer, -peer, of collaborative economy is very small scale. Here in Germany it's developed, but in developed, developed via a small scale sector. I want us on the left to raise our eyes away from those, from those, brilliant, um, those brilliant laboratory experiments in collaboration and move towards asking the state to do exactly what it did with the factory sector 200 years ago. The state should look at this new economy and say, we like that, let us protect it, let us, let us encourage it, let us use microeconomic policy to make this work so that we have a cooperative platform running Berlin's minicab businesses, maybe 10 cooperative platforms, not Uber. The state can do that tomorrow. It is not rocket science nor space fiction. Right now, the neoliberal elite is in a policy dead end. At Shanghai's G20 in March, the central bankers were warning we can do one more monetary stimulus if Jens Weidmann stops voting against it. We can do one more monetary stimulus, but after that, there must be structural reform of states. By states. What they mean is more neoliberalism, lower wages, lower pensions, longer working hours, longer working lives, more precarious work, Free trade on the terms of the monopolies, not the people. It won't work. On the left, there is also a productivist, neo-Keynesian wing. In politics, I know it well from, from, from the work I'm doing around Labour, around Corbyn, who believe in the old remedies. The state, you know, state ownership, state direction, more physical infrastructure, um, a, a plan, an industrial plan, and constant demands to create more high-value jobs. I think that's good. I think we should do all of that. But my concern is I don't think capitalism can go on creating high-value jobs. I don't think more roads and bridges and railway networks, eventually you can build them all you like. Um, Keynes once said this, but unless you revive dynamism from below in a granular way, you can build, out, you can build a planned economy, but you still won't revive dynamism. Instead, we all have to face the fact that a long transition beyond capitalism is possible. And we must stop lamenting the events that made the other form of transition impossible. For me, I'm part of, a, 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 of, of an emergent radical left in Europe that wants to combine the insights of techno theorists like Negri, like Michel Bowens of the Peer to Peer Institute, like those of the Basic Income Network. Those are the strong horizontal activist movements that produced parties like Podemos and which were instrumental in, in bringing Syriza to power in Greece. Combine all that with, a, with an approach that says the state has a vital role to play in opening the space for a post-capitalist sector and in shaping the market to make it happen. If we look at a graph of GDP in human history, I'll revert to my PowerPoint again, it's flat. For the whole of history, GDP per head is flat until we discover and pillage the Americas, and it starts going up a bit. You get to industrial capitalism, it's like this. Since 1945, for most developed countries, it's been like that. And now the developing world is also rising. Why can you, why can you imagine the doom-laden, zombie-infested end of the world but you can't imagine the graph going vertical. Why? Because it can only go vertical if, in fact, 
the well-being, the, the economic activity, the rising knowledge is not captured in the market, but is captured beyond the market. Abundance isn't an ever-rising market value of GDP. It's an ever-rising quality of human life and human experiences. And we have to have the courage to actually uh, uh, imagine it and design it, designing the transition. Uh, and as I say in the book, so that we can make mistakes, so that we can do experiments, so that one person's route is not the same as another person's route. Because of time, I'll cut to the chase, but I will say, the one thing I would say, if those of you who are interested in doing this, and it's not a, it's, I'm standing here at a lectern, but what I really want you to do is engage with the, with the idea of a modular, project-based design for an economy that moves beyond the market. We can, we can all have a go. It's not that difficult. But there's one thing that is really obvious that I think the left tradition, the socialist tradition, the state tradition can contribute. The role of the state in this transition is to cut as rapidly and, and sharply as possible the cost of inputs into labor. Imagine what it would mean to the precariat of this city, of the city I live in, to have free housing, to have free education, free transport. You know, the purpose of, the, of, of a nationalized industry in this project is not to provide profit for a declining sector of service-based private companies. It is to provide free things to most people. How hard is that to get your head around? How hard is it to explain to other people that we could be, relatively quickly, providing things free from the state if only we repurpose what we do with taxation? In my scenario, the market is not abolished from above, though, by the state. It shrinks in accordance to the rise of this collaborative networked horizontal sector. Of course, the transition I envisage must interact with the transition imagined by the climate movement. By this time in the speech, most dedicated Greens are punching themselves in the head because I've not yet mentioned climate change. Um, and I, I make no apology for this, simply because even if you take the official plan of the International Energy Agency or the more radical plan of Greenpeace for a, tra a rapid transition to zero carbon, first of all, the problem is well understood. Carbon burning is going to destroy the planet. Second, the plans are good enough. We could improve them through democracy and through collaboration, but the plans are good enough. Very few people understand that at the same time we have within our power a, a fairly rapid move towards a collaborative economy and that if we don't do it, Neoliberalism is going to destroy developed societies. On that note, I want to conclude by saying something about the European Union and about Germany. First of all, Britain's not going to exit the European Union for now. Many of us on the left favor in principle exit on the grounds of the, that the institutions are undemocratic. We don't care about migration, we want more migration. We don't care about the cost of membership. If it, were worth, if, it were good, if it were a good institution, it would be worth paying for. But after what we saw in Greece last summer, many of us on the British left are very, very skeptical that this institution can be reformed. Here's where my difference lies with Varoufakis, for example. But the time for leaving it for us is not now. Because what has happened in our country is that the, the ultra-right of the Conservative Party has hijacked the whole thing. And they are seeking a mandate on June the 23rd for a return to Thatcherism. That's what they want. That's all that's being modeled, and that's all that they're advocating. So much so that even in the last two weeks, you may know that some black and Asian people, working class people, favored Brexit on grounds of it's a way to stop East European migration, bringing in a, work, a, a lower paid working class that competes with them for jobs. That's a, 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 probably an unknown fact outside Britain. But the, the tone of the right-wing conservatism around Brexit has sent all of those voters back to remain, and me, because I just cannot think that it's the right time to do it now. But the European Union project as a whole is in jeopardy. The old problem was currency that doesn't work, 
a treaty that makes austerity obligatory, a central bank designed to produce deflation, and this country, Germany, that did not want to lead, that took the upside of the arrangement, but never wanted to take any of the problems of the downside. But under Merkel and Schäuble, there's a different problem. In, in July last year, Europe moved from being an organization based on the rule of law to one based on force. When Merkel's government and its allies in Eastern Europe combined to suppress the democratic will of the Greek people, I think something changed. It, it, it became a force-based institution. And then came the refugee crisis. I applaud Mrs. Merkel and the German people for their, for their hospitality to the refugees, and I criticize my own government for its own cynical, heartless failure to do what Germany has done. We should be letting in 100,000 plus refugees tomorrow. But again, the problem is it was done through a flamboyant gesture. And now the former allies, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, the Hungarians, don't like it. And now we've got a right-wing backlash that is really serious. Those of you who are young, who thought you could never see this again, I'm afraid it, you're going to see it. Over Greece, it was the center in Europe and the right versus the left. Over refugees, it's the left and some of the center versus the right. With the events in Austria and the threat that the illegal deal with Turkey will fall apart and we get another million refugees this summer or next summer, we have to reframe the problem. And we have to say this to the center, the center ground, the SPD here, the Labour Party, the Liberals, even the Conservatives in my country. I don't think the political center in Europe can any longer defend the institutions and freedoms and values it wants. Simply by existing, neoliberalism must last forever. It has to break. As the British movie director Ken Loach said when he won the Palm d'Or, we basically have to choose between humanism and neoliberalism. And I think we have to appeal above all to social democracy, to the SPD and SPE, break with neoliberalism, promote a radical solution to poverty and stagnation, reopen the Lisbon and other treaties to remove the shackles on EU governments so you can expand the economy into all these terrible deflated towns, whether they be in Eastern Germany or the Tyrol in Austria, where, where the right is growing. Allow the ECB to do monetary stimulus unrestrained and targeted to create growth across all of Europe not just some of Europe. We're a rich continent. We don't need to go imposing austerity and misery on the young or stagnation on the low-income countries of the East. Rosa Luxemburg's generation saw Berlin go from luxury capitalism to war, starvation, and civil conflict in the space of 10 years. And the greatest intellectual failure of neoliberalism was to convince a whole generation that there are always solutions and that it's usually the market. Free market principles are some kind of guarantee against a repeat of the terrible things that happened in the past. You know, we have to pre prepare ourselves now for the fact that they were wrong. We have to say to the 1%, Es gibt auch eine gute Nachricht. Die 99% eilen ihm zur Hilfe. Der Postkapitalismus wird euch befreien. So thank you very, very much for this interesting talk. Um, before I open up to all of you, I'd like, um, out of the many, many interesting points you made, I'd like to touch up upon very few, and then um, I'll hand over to you. And I'll be speaking English because I thought it's kind of weird if I speak German <laughs> to you and, <laughs> and you, you need the earphones. So um, the first question I'd like to raise is, um, about the relevance of info technologies and its impact on um, the transformation towards capitalism. You and you, uh, you in your book, you draw um, on the zero marginal cost theory, and um, that has been popularized by Jeremy Rifkin recently, most recently. And I mean, you you just explained um, how it works. And um, for you, this is a key argument um, to conclude that these new forms of technology 
um, actually are not only compatible with capitalism, but um, are reaching beyond it and you said are robbing mm. its abilities. And um, I feel a range uh, for a broad range of digital products, and you mentioned them, um, this seems very compelling. At the same time, and you said that too, um, there's uh, there, even these virtual products um, have a material side. So, for example, for an MP3 um, song, um, it can be repl replicated at no cost, but in order to play it, I need an iPod. And um, the same is true for the Internet of Things, for example. So um, the washing machine might get instruction um, via the Internet, but uh, before that, someone needs to produce it. And I feel a lot of labor goes in there. So um, what I, I really like to ask you is, um, like, for how relevant do you think that this sector actually, let's call it this, or these anti-systemic tendencies are actually within, or if we compare it with, um, like, the entire economy, for example. So how broad is that sector? Because I feel it, um, it matters in the, um, uh, to the question how relevant it can become in a transition or transformation towards uh, post-capitalism. Um, yeah, then. So, yes, and thank you for that question, and thank you for your applause. Oh. Thank you for the question, and thank you for that kind applause. Um, so, what's important, I think, is to understand that, that large parts of the physical world are now shaped by information in a way that they weren't before. So if you look at an airliner going above your head, it looks like what it would look like 50 years ago. But it's been made virtually before it's been made. So on a 3D supercomputer, the, every screw has the physical properties of a brass screw, every strut, the, the, the pro properties of an aluminum strut, the carbon uh, fiber in the wing bends as it lands, it lands and they watch what it does. They do it 186 million times. And what's the result? The engineering process has radically changed. Instead of you design on paper, and it's called in English, you throw it over the wall and the engineers catch it and you start making it, most of the defects can be, can be eradicated in the design process. It's quite a big change, not only in engineering, but in human life. Because it, what it means is that no, no act of imagination is wasted anymore. That the, the brain work and the design work um, can radically reduce the cost of the physical work. If you then imagine the plane flying along, as it's going, it's firing back data to Seattle. If it's been made by Pratt & Whitney, it's firing back data to the HQ of the, of the, of the, of the engine maker. So there are 60,000 engines doing the same thing at the same time. And the data is collected. What does that mean? Suddenly, we, could, we have the ability to say, do you know what? This kind of engine tends to uh, come under stress at this point in a flight or at this point in its life cycle and we can preempt it. That reduces the cost too of making and maintaining and replacing engines. Not to zero, but quite a lot. So, okay, in capitalist circumstances, obviously Pratt and Whitney want to make a lot of money out of selling engines. Apple wants to make a lot of money out of selling us music and they do. But if you, it's about conceptualizing the transition. If you understand that it, that, that it is possible to use this spontaneous impact of information to make things cheaper, if instead of trying to counteract it, you push it further or you let it happen, what should happen is this, that I'm presuming there are some Marxist literate people in the, in the room who understand Marxist theory of value. If the labor input to a machine falls quite a lot, then that machine will only transfer it much smaller amounts of value year, out, year in, year out to the final product. And the end result of that will be, eventually, that the cost of reproducing our labor should also fall if we make it happen. So that if at the same time we use social wages to also reduce the cost of, our, of reproducing our own labor, you then get two virtu virtuous forces. You get the falling cost of the dead labor, the machines, and the falling cost of the living labor. This, in the post-capitalist trans trans transition, is good. 
And we know it's good because, look, I didn't put the word Grundrisse into the title of my book. My illustrious translators at Surkamp did. Um, but, of course, in the Grundrisse, Marx imagined this. He, he, he writes, the ideal machine for capitalism is one that costs nothing and lasts forever. And, he, and, and in case you're wondering, he, he worked it out. What would that mean for the, for the theory of value? Does a machine that costs nothing and lasts forever go on transferring value to the products as if it had cost a lot? No, it transfers almost nothing, says Marx. He also imagined what would be needed to make such machines. You'll probably know the phrase he used, the general intellect. Knowledge becomes social and shared by everybody it, to an extent that, it, that capitalist relations of production can no longer contain it. Now, Marx doesn't have a full theory of a technology-driven uh, transition to post-capitalism. And in fact, as pointed out by many scholars, there is a different set of ideas, in, in fact, in capital. That's what, what caused Antonio Negri to call the Grundrisse Marx beyond Marx. Nevertheless, it's entirely within our lexicon to understand these things. And so I just thought I'd give you those examples as, as a way, uh, the way I've, I, I have understood it. Of course, it's hard to explain to people who don't agree with the labor theory of value, but we're trying. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, uh, let me take up um, on the on the uh, the transition um, question that you um, just mentioned. Niaran. Okay. Uh, on the transition um, question, because you also um, like I think again drawing on Rifkin, um, you mention um, you, you say that like the transi the transition to post capitalism um, might look more like an eclipse, um, like uh, supplanting capitalism with uh, new cooperative forms. Um, and of course, I mean, it sounds great, almost cozy to me, um, but the question that for me um, like, uh, obviously arises is the question of power relations in that process. So I wonder how you think, um, uh, like if you imagine that transition, um, how do you think about uh, questions like, would, would there be a point when we need to think about taking over, for example, the means of production, or do we need to think about uh, uh, the question of taking power in whatever forms um, that might might arise that question and uh, just one last sentence and and didn't as I mean doesn't the the recent example of Greece and you reported so much on it um, prove that the power elites of this financialized um, capitalism will cling to um, their power and and their uh, forms of production even though they have proven uh, like um, not very useful, but so h how can we address that? And uh, one sentence: you, you mentioned the state in your um, in your um, talk, and I mean I would agree to everything you said. The state should do, but um, for some reason we haven't succeeded on that end either. Okay. In the book, um, those of you who've read it will know that. Despite my criticisms of him, I am quite, quite inspired by Rudolf Hilferding. Because Hilferding, I think, was the, the one who understood at the time the, trans, the transition capitalism was going through. And the beauty of Hilferding's theory, finance capitalismus, is that it became a shared um, lexicon, a shared alphabet between revolutionary Marxism, reformism, and actually even Keynesianism and liberalism because Hilferding was working in the tradition of liberal economics. He had le you know, learned from Bern Bauwerk in, in Vienna. Now, in the book, I've purposely stayed away from political strategy, partly because, as you'll hear, both on Brexit and maybe somebody wants to ask about nuclear weapons, I also have views about political strategy and, and, and politics. And you don't have to share them to share the analysis in the book, first of all. So, um, but what do I think personally about if, if, we can, if we can erect a kind of intellectual um, playing field on which we can talk to our colleagues, people like Rifkin, is, you know, he's consulting for Xi Jinping now. I mean, he's, 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 he's in there with the Chinese bureaucracy. Meanwhile, the Silicon Valley guys who use the words post-capitalism really mean a kind of uh, 
a post-capitalism in which no capitalist pays any tax is what they're really uh, uh, working on. So, yeah, obviously, I am, I, I, am, um, I am inspired by, and I think I stand in the tradition of, uh, Syriza and Podemos. I happen to be in the British Labour Party because we took it over uh, by the complete accident, but we managed to do it. Um, if the enemy, yeah, if, the, if, if the neoliberals take it back over, I think not because of me, but because of what the unions would do, we will end up with a British Syriza. But we exist in this world where we have to think about power. First thing is to say, of course, horizontal structures don't abolish power imbalances. They sometimes express them quite badly. And in other words, every tent camp always has an issue with uh, sexual, sexual violence or harassment. Um, every tent camp, you get a guy who is a professor and who thinks they should be able to speak and cannot understand why they are not you know, on the list of speakers. And, and sometimes you have something called a calming down squad that you have to deploy. Uh, and it's much better than the calming down squad of the old labor movement, but it still has to be a calming down squad. So you know, horizontalism doesn't solve problems of sexism, racism, you know, all those, those other things. But at the level of the state, what do I think that we have to get our heads around? Of course, you'll know because I think in your introduction to me, you said I was on the far left in the 1980s and 90s. That's true. And we had a Marxist, you know, classically Marxist view of what the state should do. The most radical thing for us to get our heads around, ex-left, ex ex-revolutionary Marxist leftists, is that I think the state has to abolish itself economically quite fast, not just in terms of its repressive functions. I'm talking in a hundred years scale here. That you, you can have a market sector generating taxes for a state sector, but if at the same time a non-market sector is eroding and corroding that market sector, eventually there's not enough money to pay from this, to the state itself. Therefore, the abundance... Uh, the, the desire is to make as much as possible free. So you have to, it's not easy. You have to try and work out what the phases of the transition are. In the book, I try and learn from a Soviet economist called Yevgeny Preobrazhensky, who was one of the, he was a Trotskyist and uh, later went back into, uh, with, with Stalin, but was still ex executed in 1936. But Preobrazhensky was one of the last people in Marxist economics to understand that transitions have objective laws, that you, can't, that you can't solve everything by willpower, and you have to study what you've created and how it's interacting. So, look, there's a lot of short-term things I would do to the state here and, 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 in, and in Britain, um, and, and it, they would mainly involve unleashing democracy on it. Um, I think that, you know, but, we can maybe talk about that, but I'm just trying to make clear what the role of the state is in the transition process that I envisage. Okay, so um, as I don't want to be the only one speaking here, I just have one last question to you and then um, it's your turn. Um, uh, I'd like, on, like, to conclude from my part, I'd like to touch on the um, um, subject of, the, of agency, actually, yeah. and yeah. the subjects of change. Um, so you write um, in your book, Infocapitalism has created a new agent of change in history, the educated and connected human being. And then you said that in, the, in your talk too, um, it's the, all this many small cooperatives and stuff. Um, but at the same time, in your um, analysis, um, when you go through the Kondratyev mm. sh um, waves, um, you claim that capitalism was only able to um, reform and, and um, go on an, on a like um, innovative path when it was confronted with a forced and uh, when it was confronted and forced by a strong and organized labor movement. So um, yeah, and, and there's this book by um, Greg Scharzer with the wonderful title "No Local Small Scale Alternatives Won't Change the World." So I, I just yeah. wonder how you think about these two um, um, poles, maybe, like the small scale alternatives that we need to develop, and I totally agree here, but then shouldn't we be thinking about how to like, build from there mm. and have also mm. some kind mm. of political structures, mm. organizations, mm. in order to make them into a force that can actually um, yeah. uh, move power relations. So, yeah. I, just, so yeah. I, I think that's a great question. And, and it's in many ways, it will be solved by, by struggle. But just to be clear about what I say about agency. 
first of all, you know, I believe that the, that the, the proletariat in history was the most powerful and most advanced subject, uh, revolution, you know, historic subject. But I also say that what it generally wanted was to live within a space within capitalism. Whatever it said it wanted, what it often, what it often ac accepted was more control. And, you know, those of us who've lived our early part of our lives, like me, in a world where we believed that, that you, the only thing stopping the proletariat from taking power was bad leaders, yeah, um, or bad strategy, I think we're wrong. But in any case, what's happened? The proletariat of the world has doubled in size. That's, the, that's number one. Number two, even where it's doubled in size, this quality of being more individual, more networked, uh, less, less spontaneously collective, is found everywhere. I found this when I went to India and China. You ask labor organizers, what, it, what is it like? Because you say, because in my country, nobody under 35 wants to join the union. Everybody over 55 loves the union. And they say, well, weirdly, that's the same here. Um, and, 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 you know, men in Indian cotton trade union offices with a bust of Lenin on their, on their desk will tell you, you know, the working class does not think like the working class anymore. Okay, there are two solutions. One is we try to educate them. We try to, we try to see whether they're interested in being an old style working class. But meanwhile, what we find is the expanded footprint of individualism also gives them some power. And what I am totally against is the idea prevalent among my generation is that people with white wire coming out of their ears are in some way narcissistic. And, the, and that the uh, obsession with personal politics, uh, personal liberty, personal shape, self, selfness is in some way selfish. I, I think it's the way capitalism has now created a lot of people. And what we saw in 2011 was almost the equivalent of, the, of what happened in Britain in 1819, the first workers' struggle. We saw people who were written off as passive and useless suddenly do things all over the world, Tahrir Square, Occupy Wall Street, Brit the British universities, France. They're doing it now with Nuit Debout. They did it in uh, Turkey with Gezi Park. Now, of course, the problem is, without work as the center of the struggle, what is the narrative? And I mean, my answer would be, well, the narrative, as Negri puts it, I think he is right on this, if wrong on a lot of other things, that for in modern capitalism, modern capitalism exploits us in the workplace, through the market as consumers, through the financial market. I'm damn certain that the capitalist making the most rate of profit from me is the one who owns my credit card, not, not even the one who employs me as a rate of profit. And therefore, because we're exploited threefold through society, Negri is right to say society is like the social factory, and what we have to do is find each other across the factory floor, across society. Now, that's not so easy, but also it wasn't very easy for our grandfathers to find each other in the great-grandfathers in the factories of, um, of Wilhelmine Prussia, because there were Christian trade unions, and there were reactionary people, and there were also socialists. And you had to find each other and work out what to do. So we're at the early stages of it. But I do, I do think that the networked individual, so well documented by modern sociology, is, and here I get to use a second German word, basically, the, the, it is the working class sublated, transformed and made better as an agent of history. The German word is Aufhebung. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So, um, is there a make my yes? Here's a microphone. Please, if you, if you want to um, ask a question, raise your hand so that I can see you and um, she can see you. And then, please speak into the microphone. Otherwise, the translators won't be able to hear you, and Paul might not be able to understand you. Jetzt spreche ich wieder Deutsch, weil um, sehr Quatsch. Ich verstehe. Okay, sehr gut. Also, um, ich uh, gucke, wer sich meldet und the floor is yours. Ach so, ich, ähm, ich sammle ein paar Fragen und dann ähm, beantwortet Paul die irgendwie im Zusammenhang. Ähm, 
collect a couple of questions. Okay. No. Oh, you have the earphones. Okay. Yeah, I will ask the question in English. Um, <laughs> Um, what do you think about uh, UBI, um, Universal Basic Income, and how that will impact uh, your theory? Yeah, I'll also go for English. Um, Complementing the question of uh, the state, uh, what's your position on the nation state like uh, on the national level of governance and the nation state as something that emerged from western europe and the role it had within the development of capitalism what do you think could be the role for uh, urban forms of governments local forms of governments for example you are seeing interesting experiments in barcelona um, so yeah Ich mache es mal auf Deutsch. Ähm, wie ist es denn mit dem neoliberalen Staat? Gibt es sowas? Also kann man einfach den Staat übernehmen als eine neutrale Instanz sozusagen? Oder ist der Staat im Neoliberalismus, setzt er bestimmte Regeln durch? Äh, ist er sozusagen nicht nur faktisches Organ bestimmter Interessen, sondern auch von seiner Struktur her? I support the universal uh, basic income, but I think what we need to do is trial it and model it. We're at the beginnings of the trials now, and what, what's its role? It's a, it's a one-off subsidy for automation, because we're not, going to use the, we're not going to raise productivity and use the power of automation unless we can find a way of delinking work from wages. Now, it's a big change for those of us brought up in the workers' tradition, because our utopias were based on work, And, and we, this is what André Gortz says. On so much he was wrong, the French Marxist, uh, Austrian-born French Marxist André Gortz. But I think he was right that utopias based on work have to be supplemented now by other utopias. So the UBI is important. There's a lot of trials happening, um, but we need more. You know, we need to be modeling it with big computers as well, because I think we will only find out so much from the trials about, about behavior. We need to model it macroeconomically. And the reason we need to do this is I am serious about this. A lot of people uh, experimenting with it believe it could be a kind of beautiful dream. Yeah? But I think we can do it. I want social democratic parties to, to accept within the next 10 years that it is doable and begin doing it. I think even in, the, in Corbyn's Labour Party, Obviously, you know, we are up against a lot of problems. And what I said, we had an economics conference uh, on Saturday with Corbyn and his co-leader, MacDonald. I said, think about the UBI for 2025, because you, you won't even be able to have a proper trial of it in Britain until you get into power. Now, the next thing, of course, is the state. And I'll, let me come straight to this issue of, of, urban, of urban space, that is cities. I think... One interesting thing is that networked individuals gravitate towards cities, young people, because they are an analog version of a network. It allows you to constantly interface with lots of people for lots of different reasons. Um, and the, uh, cities look to me to be a bit like early capitalism. Cities were the unit of experiment. You know, in Shakespeare, the ideal city is usually a republic, uh, with a, a maritime republic. And that's no accident, because when Shakespeare was writing a kind of idealized, real-time explanation of what's going on inside capitalism, he would choose the, you know, places like Venice, places like Genoa, because they were trading cities. I think this is happening now, not just cities, but, but sub-districts of cities. I'm going on Friday to Madrid to... Um, to speak at a conference organized, uh, well, un partly under the uh, sponsorship of Manuela Carmena's uh, city government, the Podemos-backed, uh, Oncomu-backed city government in Madrid. And what we're discussing is how do you do, how do you make a non-neoliberal city? So, you know, 
in the space of maybe two years since I finished writing this book, this has become a possibility to ask. And here's the prize, because I think if Barcelona um, and if Madrid even just achieve two or three basic reforms along the lines of using network technology to dismantle neoliberalism within a city, then it will be possible to go to much less radical people like the social democratic mayors of Germany and Austria and say, look, this works. Why do you not do this? We pioneered it in the same way as the factory system. You know, people said, look, you didn't invent this. You don't really understand it, but look how good it is. Um, do it. Now, the neoliberal st so states, okay, there's a big, there's a states, there's a big moment of recognition coming, I think, for the young generation. A lot of young people think they live in a friction-free global world where everybody is just a citizen of the world. Um, and it would be great if that were the, the case. But the crisis that is coming down the tracks, remember, the mainstream are predicting stagnation. What's going to happen? If we don't solve it, one or more states will head for the exit from globalization, just as they did in the 1930s. Britain was one of the first, and it came off the gold standard. Um, the, if that happens, it's not going to be good. But we, you, you, it's like trench, trench warfare. You defend the front trench, which is globalization, as long as you can, in my view. But if it's overrun, other people abandon it. What are you going to do? Stand there forever. Because if you stand there forever, you become the last per people to act. And we know from the 1930s that the last states to stop obeying the rules had the worst outcomes, and this was one of them. Uh, so, yeah, I think that the important thing is, if this happens, if your generation has to deal with this, is to understand that every step away from a global system you make is going to take a lot of time to build back up, and it's not going to be good. The worst thing would be if, as in the 1980s, the left embraced national-centered solutions and said, these are good. This is why, incidentally, you see Sakalotos signing this deal with the European Union yesterday, with the... With the, with the Eurozone yesterday. Sakalotos, every time I meet him, every time, simply says, my only thing is to avoid the 1930s. If I step back from this into a national solution for Greece, I know it's a, zero -sum, it's a minus zero-sum game for Greece. We're on the edge of Turkey. We're one border post away from the Islamic State. What am I going to do with a global system? So it's that, I think that mentality is right. Then, oh, the neoliberal state and come, what should we do about it? Well, here's a problem you have when you don't have the proletariat. Uh, the state's a hierarchy. The proletarian movement was a hierarchy. At some points, including here, too hierarchical. Too many, too many party soldiers, too much discipline. Without it, though, we do have a problem. And I, you know, I think we can learn a lot from, from the writings of Antonio Gramsci and, and about what, what in, a West, in a complex Western society you have to do. You have to build the hegemony of ideas. You have to take the ideas, whether it's my ideas or just the normal ideas of left-wing social democracy, and you try and find a way of making them inhabit the minds of people and th so that their activity day by day embodies the ideas. And I think we can learn a lot Actually, not just from Gramsci, but of somebody else I hope you have heard of, which is Ferdinand Lassalle. I think that, that the legacy of Ferdinand Lassalle's socialism of the 1850s left for the global labor movement was very strong and not well recognized by the Marxist movement because the Lassalleans everywhere understood that by doing small things, you improve your life and you embody the future. And that's kind of what we've got to do. If it, I mean... I have no doubt that the, that the global elite will go down fighting. Um, what they will be fighting against and for could be quite difficult to work out. And we're not at that stage yet. In fact, as I said in the, in the opening introduction, we are still at a stage, I think it's quite anomalous, to some, quite similar to say 1936, where we should be saying to the elite, you, am, you think you're humanists, so do we. Let's both, uh, let's both act together to prevent the right from winning. And for that reason, you must break from your economic craziness. And we may have to make some compromises, just as the Popular Front in the 1930s did. That was a compromise. 
That's where I think we are. So, yeah. Okay, um, so there were there were two other questions. Noch. Um, du and then you. Da an der Tür, blaues Hemd an der Tür. Und dann du als Nächster. Und hey Paul, uh, thank you very much. This was extremely interesting for me. Um, I have a question. I'm not exactly sure if you might perhaps already talked about this. Now, usually it's the rich countries who say we have the social reforms, blah, blah, blah. We teach the poor countries how it's going. Mm -hmm. Do I understand you right that this time it's going to be the other way around? It's going to be the poor countries who, who's going to do it first and the rich countries who's going to follow? Do you mean in Europe or in the world? In the world. Okay. I'm just collecting. You mentioned that um, the network individuals need to find ourselves across the factory floor or across networks. Uh, what's your view on so called hashtag activism? Yeah, um, Paul, I. I very much appreciated the first part of, of your book about the uh, um, history of thought on, on contour death waves and so on. So I learned, learned a lot. But I, Barbara Fried already raised this question, her first question concerning your idea that we are actually approaching a zero cost economy mm. or something like this. I have very serious doubts that you are right in this point. I think if this would be right, then you would use actually no resources, neither uh, human resources nor, nor, uh, nor natural resources. And what I see in the world is it's, a, it's a completely opposite. Yeah? Mm. We are using resources to a large scale and, mm. and, and the increasing uh, global middle class is in, in using a huge amount of resources mm. and working power and so on. And that's not for free. That's it. That is our serious real cost. Mm. And so I think a keystone in your argumentation fails to convince okay. and is leading in the wrong direction. One more? Yeah. So oh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, there's an idea that from Arnold Peters that came to my mind when I listened to your speech, um, who argues that when we take steps towards a more global administration and by using information technology, we could implement some f uh, form of global planned economy which could um, resolve the problem of uh, hunger that we are facing by um, producing any kind of good all over the world and to uh, contribute to distribu distributing them more equally more in a more equitable way. And uh, yeah, I would like to know what okay. your opinion is on that. Okay, um, I'll be really brief. I'm sorry for being too long before. To your uh, question about um, which countries will go first, like in, like in all um, technologically driven transition projects it's the advanced countries that have to that have to go first uh, you you know you if you're sitting in the Philippines and the president the guy who's going to be president has got his death squads marching around your slum and you live above a river in which there are rats and your children swimming you know sewage it's quite hard to imagine the transition to a non to a classless society so, so those kind of countries have to solve the physical problems. Um, it's also the case, however, as with all, you know, Trotsky you know, once, once talked about uneven and combined development and the combined nature of tasks in an underdeveloped country, if you take in the classic Marxist sense, I think there's a version of that in my theory as well. There's even a version of Narodnism, actually, the Russian Narodniks believed that the Russian commune, the peasant commune, could be preserved if it could, if it could last and survive the industrialization process and the working class could kind of come to its rescue and rescue it un, you know, unmolested 
for a communist future. They were wrong, it, it didn't happen. But I think we have to, those are, the, those are the parameters. Advanced first, combined and uneven development, and then maybe there will be pools of, of the undeveloped world that can benefit. For example, in Kenya, there is an entirely capitalist parallel currency called M-Pesa, whereby people uh, with almost nothing can send cash to each other for, between villages using cell phones. And it's been going for at least five years, five, more than five years, and it works. Okay, it's, it's sponsored by banks. The global NGOs have kind of, have kind of fostered it. But it proved that you can map high-tech solutions onto low-tech societies. And what I would argue is that you know, a post if you took my book to Kenya and said, right, well, what do we do? Then it's for the people themselves to decide what is more important. Personally, I would rather have a toilet than anything else, uh, than, you know, uh, than anything else. But I think those societies themselves will work out the combined nature of the program. Hashtag activism, you know, it's not, it's barely activism. It's important to have memes, to have to be able to seize what that we can seize from control over the ideology, ideological apparatus. And I do believe social media has more or less fundamentally removed the state and the elite's monopoly over, over propaganda, but it doesn't solve the problem of ideology, of people just basically believing a load of rubbish in their heads. Um, but I, but what, what I do think is important is that what, what movements have done is used social media to find each other. And, you know, Castells describes this with the, with the Indignados movement of the, uh, the May 9th movement of, uh, of, uh, in Spain in 2011. He says, they found each other online and then they sort of brought the internet into reality. I, I'm paraphrasing it. And I think it's important for that. Um, right now, you know, I'm speaking to people in Britain who are organising low-paid uh, cleaners to go on strike, migrant workers, uh, sex workers organizing their own university. All of this is possible because they have a distributed network. They don't have to go through hierarchy. don't have to ask me for permission to do it. So that's what, what, what I think is valuable about social media. But social media didn't cause this uprising. People looked at 2011 and said, it must be Facebook. Even in Tahrir Square, people said, thank you, Facebook. Really, it's, it's what human life has become with networks and knowledge that is the real thing. Now, on your critique of me, I can't answer all of that at, at once. Of course, we are seeing large-scale resource usage. Um, and actually, in the book, what I argue is that one, I try to go, I try to argue, what would it look like if capitalism survived the zero cost um, phenomenon? And one thing I think it would do is seek to create artificially high costs through, through seeking to create artificially high and costly usage of, 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 of both technology and raw materials. But all, all I would say is this, when I first started reporting on computing, people used to do pre presentations for us, showing us the, si the, 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 the diameter of a, fi carb a fiber optic cable, which is about this big. And then they used to say, to meet the demand for traffic in 10 years' time, it will have to be as big as a house. In fact, the, c the copper wire going out of my house, which is 30 years old, carries as much traffic as uh, it carries rather 10 times as the amount of traffic that we ever thought it could because we put switches at either end. And I think that and the switches were more intelligent and they enabled the intelligent use of the raw material, copper. If we adopt that principle, what we, not, it's not what we are doing, but what we should do is we should be able to use raw materials much less by adopting the equivalent of switches, that is, things that use the capacity more intelligently. And... On the global planned economy, while it's a nice thing to uh, want, um, I'm not in favour of the planned economy. I don't think we need the same kind of planned economy as to do this transition. What you need is a, a growing collaborative sector that functions according to its own spontaneous rules, a market that's shrinking, and a state that underpins it all and guides it all by producing stuff as cheaply as possible and shaping the, the market sector. All that gives you is the beginnings of a dynamic, and, you, and then you're flying just as blind as the 
architects of the first five-year plan and the second five-year plan were flying because you have to judge the res results and, and, and work out what's going on. I'd rather start in a city than the world because I think we're, we're, some of this stuff is completely unproven. But there are things that we're going to need world coordination for. And the, the obvious one is energy. I mean, Germany is taking fantastic strides, even under uh, a CDU, CSU uh, and SPD government, uh, on energy. But what we should really be doing is putting solar array, arrays in the Sahara and linking up the fjords of Norway and, and having a transcontinental energy system. You know, if we really want to reduce energy, that's the only way we're going to do it. And so that's what I would make as a priority for doing. Okay. So, ich glaube, wir machen noch eine Runde. Eine Meldung war da oder war da hinten? War da auch noch jemand? Alle, die sich was, die was genau. Also eins, zwei. Oder wir fangen hinten an. Adrian. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm a little bit surprised by your techno optimism. So that's. Of course, an interesting contribution, but in a way, some other discourse, even in the field of authors that you quote, Negri, the accelerationists, or even Evgeny Morozov, mm -hmm. they have a more pessimistic view on the question of, uh, of the technologies. And I, I, I'm also questioning a little bit the possibility if we can um, disconnect the uh, technological optimism from, let's say, power structures, let's say from exploitation mechanisms that are built within the technologies. So I'm a little bit more skeptic in that field and I, and I would ask, what is the, the basis that, that you can make this very positive claim? Of, of, of course, you could be an optimist, but maybe there's some, some more explanation that yeah. I would like to hear from you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your talk, um, and I very much enjoyed reading your book. But I'm, I have similar doubts as my, uh, the, the speaker uh, mm -hmm. a moment ago. Is there a necessary or inherent link between, on the one hand, let's say marginal cost theory and uh, whatever info uh, capitalism, and a society where we really would like to live in? Mm -hmm. So uh, is there a necessary link between whatever, how you envisage uh, capitalism as we know it now dying off and being replaced by sort of enlightened and whatever nice uh, uh, society. Could it not also be uh, equally adopted by, let's say, all the people who are now on the rise, by uh, right-wing populists and so on, and uh, that we might see capitalism going but not in a way we, uh, we like it? Because I think that's sort of a fundamental assumption in your book that you don't even, in a way, discuss or question. Mm. It seems, reading the book, it seems as uh, post-capitalism will always necessarily, uh, whatever, be replaced by nice little communes where everybody's ni uh, nice to each other. Mm. <laughs> ja, Sie beschreiben um, den Postkapitalismus als eine uh, Netzwerkökonomie also mit kleinteiligen dezentralen Strukturen. Das heißt, die Grundlage der alten Monopole werden, also des Industriekapitalismus, bestehen nicht mehr. Aber die Informationstechnologie führt ja neue Grundlagen für das Entstehen von großen und beherrschenden Unternehmen ein. Also der Netzwerkeffekt, das ist ja die Grundlage für das Entstehen von Facebook, Google etc. Das habe ich eigentlich in Ihrem hm. Buch vermisst. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I should have said more about the network effect in the, in the introduction. The network effect is when all of us interact together, a third thing is created almost above our heads, some new knowledge that either we control or somebody else controls. And right now, these big information monopolies are farming this we call it externalities, spillovers, the, the, the positive accidental contribution we make by interacting. They are owning it all. And, and part of the struggle is to take control away from them. I mean, right now, this is what uh, Podemos and Ancomu in, 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 
in Spain are trying are going to do. They're, they're going to see how much of the collectively produced data of a city they can move back into the public sphere and into the collective sphere. Obviously, it has to be anonymized, but it's a resource for us and not for them. I also think there's an important point to make about the externalities, the network effect, and that is that I once interviewed Larry Page, who was the uh, founder of Google, and I asked him what he wanted to do in his life. And he said, I want to make a machine that knows everything. And, and I didn't think of it at the time, but if I could say it now, I would say, you can't have a machine that knows everything until everybody can ask it questions. And only you can ask questions, because you see what we do on Google, we don't. They, they never, ever, that is their secret source. That's the, what makes it a multi-billion dollar company, the fact that they see it and we don't, and therefore they'll never know the right questions. So I think in this sense, these things are already retarding progress. But there's a worse thing to come. Artificial intelligence is going to be really big. And I've got two worries, okay, I'll come to your worry about the Jeremy Rifkin world in a minute. One of my worries is about the artificial intelligence probably moves computing back to the center and away from the network. And the natural form of an AI business is going to be a, mono a one monopoly with a centralized hierarchical control. Because it's it, only one, you know, an AI needs one person to ask its sensible questions, whereas humanity needs everybody to be able to ask the questions. So, so that, I take your point, and what, what I think the, the struggle will involve is literally concretizing how do we remove from these large corporations the, their assumed right to own and see collectively produced data. That's part of the struggle I'm in favor of. The Morozov question, Yevgeny Morozov, uh, you know, I, I think actually, do you know, weirdly, I, I don't think that the two of us disagree. Uh, he, he's coming to Madrid on Friday as well, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll all sit together on the same platform, so it should be fun. Um, I'm trying to outline what is possible, and, you know, I think he write, everything he writes is correct, that, that, that the Silicon Valley wants to monopolize this. And the Silicon Valley actually wants to create a kind of neo-feudalism, which kind of answers the, the, the what happens, your question, the, the other question, that, sir, what, what happens, what is post-capitalism? I think Silicon Valley wants to create a situation where the elite live off their asset wealth, the poor are supported by the state. For some reason, the elite don't still pay taxes into that state, so we don't quite know how it works. And you'll even get people like Eric Schmidt, the boss of Google, talks about post-capitalism. So yes, there is no ownership of the left over the post-capitalist concept. It was Peter Drucker, the center-right Schumpeterian management theorist who invented the term uh, in its modern form. So my, my optimism comes from this. One of the only virtues of being 56 is to, is to see how much more intelligent and connected and almost kind of better human beings a young generation are that has very, not unlimited, but very high uh, access to information and a high understanding of personal worth as a human being. Um, Often their struggles seem to be about them. So if you're a trade unionist, um, you know, everybody over the age of 40 knocks on the door and says, can, can I join the union? I've just moved here. Everybody on the age of 35 says, I don't want to join the union because it's too expensive. But then if they do knock on the door and they say, somebody harassed me or somebody uh, didn't give me a job that I was supposed to get. And you have to take a deep breath and go, okay, right, uh, join the union and come on in and let's all struggle together. And sometimes it's difficult, but I do think that those people on the young end of things have shown that with their better access to knowledge and better education and better understanding of the self and emotional intelligence, they can do things. And that, that actually, rather than any technological, uh, opt techno-utopian theory, it's the humanistic utopian theory. Like I say, I think, what stopped utopian socialism from working wasn't just scarcity, although scarcity was a big problem. It was the fact that the people trying to do it worked 12 hours a day, were suffering domestic violence, were completely, their minds were trapped in a semi-educated 
uh, slave condition, it was going to be very hard for them to jump out of that into a commune where free love is practiced. You know, but that's what they tried to do and they failed. So maybe that's not so hard for some people in Berlin. Finally, um, yeah, coming back to your issue. So why I've used the word post-capitalism is precisely because I think all forms of abundance must deliver some form of social justice. But I can imagine forms of abundance taking place that are not so brilliant, that where you know, other hierarchies are maintained, uh, where you could even, because who could imagine the Soviet bureaucracy? Nobody imagined it before it happened. Uh, but, uh, except possibly Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, but, but we have to allow ourselves to imagine a bureaucracy rising even as we try to create abundance. So yeah, it's a neutral term that I've used in, 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 in that way. But I think it's for us on the radical left, all I want to do at this stage is in, inject the dynamic of you can achieve stuff through collaboration back into a left that has been very shaped by statism and hierarchy. In other words, it is, in German terms, re-injecting Lasallianism into the Liebknecht Babel tradition because I think Lasallianism had something to, to do then and I think even now it has something probably just as, just as much to teach us. And I'll say one final thing. Our other problem, it's a practical problem, it's got two sets of people to convince. The salariat with its, you know, with its, you know, its ideas and its lifestyle. Uh, and the old working class, which has been increasingly abandoned by social democracy and is drifting off into identity politics based on ethnicity or place rather than class. Now, I think we have to deploy a mixture of the two things, as it were, statism, Keynesianism, and the post-capitalist solutions. And you'd be surprised, actually, that, that sometimes one is easier than the other in specific, you, I, it's not all statism for the working class and post-capitalism for the salariat. It, it's a mixture, but I think that the, the, the networked, the horizontal, the small scale, the cooperative can be really useful in, because it's radical, because it delivers things. It answers the question, who's going to look after me? And the answer is you. You and your friends and your colleagues in this town are going to get together and you're going to do something. That, after all, has been the message of the left for 200 years, and we mustn't forget it. Okay. Good. 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 Good.